Welcome to Showing Our Sass, the podcast. I am your host, Marta Gwen, and this season I am thrilled to introduce my good friend, A.C. Atre Manli, author Snodgrass, as we tackle topics that tend to make people clutch their pearls, especially when it comes to health and wellness. This season, we are going to tackle all kinds of topics related to taking control of our health, and we promise not to pull our punches, because we are living through a time where we just don't have time to play about our health. AC is one of those people who are driven to fight for what's right, whether it's raising awareness for her community of persons living with type 1 diabetes or pushing for fair and equitable treatment of union workers. AC uses her body and her voice to help others. AC also has a habit of trying on a lot of other people's clothes and dancing in front of cameras. You might call her a model, but she would say she just has fun doing things she loves. So without further ado, I present to you Showing Our Sass, Season 1. Let's get into it. Yeah. And whoever is so going back to the original post with the baby, of course, safe sex is different than prevention of, of conception. But my point was that this is something that we can at least talk about. We can figure out how we can remove part of the risk of sex. So we can make it, and I'm saying risk for people who want to prevent pregnancies. And most of the people want to have sex, they're not trying to have, they're not trying to get anybody pregnant. I think that yeah. if you knew that every time you had sex, a person was going to get pregnant without doubt, I think that would cut down on sex people have. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so I'm not, I mean, just, you know, sex is risky. You can make a baby out of it. So let's try to remove the possibility of that happening, if happening, even if it's temporary or if it's forever, if you don't want everyone to have children and put that onus on males for a change. I think that is so important. Now, I'm also going to say this. Um, I was having a conversation with a friend about how sex is perceived towards males and how it's perceived with, with women, their perspective. And young boys aren't expected to have a deep emotional, spiritual connection with the swirls and the hearts and the things and the things. That's not usually what's expected of them. They usually- Heartbreakers, they, notching yeah, their belt, they, they all that kind of stuff. You get you know. high five and it's done. You look at your so daddy- Sowing your, so your oats, all you those stupid- oats. You look at your daddy's playboys, yeah, yeah, you high five when you tell them, hey, me and Rebecca Peterson, oh, that's a cute young thing. Good for you, high five. And that's the depths of it. If that young lady went to her dad and said, dad, I got with Peter Meyerson, he's going to be horrified and want to blow Peter Meyerson's head off. Yeah. So we have to look at it and say, are we informing our children? Are we being respectful of our children? But the reason why you're high fiving your son is that let's say that, that his partner ends up pregnant. You know he's not going to be under the floor to the degree this young lady's got to figure out her life. Even mm -hmm. if he's responsible and visits the kid occasionally and sends some money her way, it's not going to affect his life to the fact to the that's him taking care of his responsibility. Just that's sending some care. money I'm or whatever. Money it is. Week, what's the problem? What's the problem? Send money every week. I'll see the baby on the weekend. What's the problem? So even with that, if we look at what what she's going through, that's why there's such terror. Why there's such horror when she gets into having sex. And so as opposed to punishing them for doing what they're going to do, what we all have done, what we all will do for the most part, why not fully inform them and have it be something positive? We talk to our young men, and if I may, I was talking about uh, specifically fuck boys. <laughs> and <laughs> Can you provide a definition for that? You gotta provide a definition for A real flaky, narcissistic, negative, like a stereotypical douche guy. Um, that just doesn't communicate well, doesn't really respect you. Um, you know, he's real, he, he re, he's real slick with it, convinces you of things that he's never going to follow through on, blah, 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 the bad guy. So that guy, I think that, I don't think that they are born that way. I think that they're created. And what I have always believed that these types of guys, I'm not saying that all guys are like that by no stretch. I've had probably more positive experiences with men than most. They're just good guys. I think guys are good guys, but there are going to be the flaky dudes that are out there, the narcissists and things like that. But with with this particular population that I'm speaking of, I feel like they are the type of guys that never really had to do anything to earn a woman's vagina. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? He didn't have to yes. do anything. And so when you're like that 13 year old boy and you kind of handsome, you got the one earring and you be fighting in the hallway, and the girls be like, "Ooh, that's." That's Jimmy Sampson. Ooh, he's yeah. Cute. Your your hair starts growing in a little earlier. Yeah, your hair starts growing in. You a little. They call you mannish, and you've been messing with girls since you've been around eleven years old. But it's the girls that have a crush on you, and they hear they got to do stuff with you to make a boy like you. 
So you kind of be messing with the with the unfortunate broken young ladies who don't know they mm -hmm. can more to them than that. But you've been messing with girls under their shirts and in their drawers since you've been around 11, 12. Mm -hmm. So if you've been doing this since 11 to 12, we fast forward you to 16. You've been really getting it in. Somebody has, has licked a testicle or two by the time you're 16. So when you are about 21, 22, 23, you've not had to do anything to earn the attention of a, of a young lady that requires earning. And so when a young lady's like, oh, he's a good guy, let me see what he's talking about. He's sitting there like, yeah, I mean, you know what I'm saying? She got to she gotta show me that she's serious. She got to show me something. She got to, she got to, what she bring to the table? You it's transactional. It's transactional. Yeah. And he's sitting there like, what you going to do for me? Because he's never, ever had to put long-term, intentional, focused, respectful effort into getting attention. And that's mm -hmm. how they're created. But he also, I guarantee, was not told at a young age, you know, son, if you're ever ready to have sex, this is how you need to really make sure that you are safe. And this is what you do to make sure that she's enjoying herself. Mm -hmm. How many dads have talked to a young man and not in a nasty elbow kind of way, but you do know that this might be something that's really sensitive for her. This might be something that makes her kind of scared. She's not ready. Ask her if she's ready. Tell her that it's okay if y'all don't want to do anything. That, that whole conversation, how many dads are doing as opposed to, man, you did it. High five. Hey, put your Jimmy hat on. High five. And it's, it's no deeper than that. My son is handsome. He's on the football team. And nobody's talking about the full psychological requirement to grow and mature in the responsibility of being a person who's going to be sexually interactive with someone else. They're not to having embrace it. good sexual health practices. Yeah, exactly. You're right. Yeah. So he's able to connect it. If you're supposed to connect emotions to sex with he healthily, it should be there. Sometimes it's not. It just is. And people just be like, hey, you got a penis, you got a vagina. Let's make them high five. Hey, but in the best case scenario, there's an emotion that connects to it. There's passion that's connected to it. There's care and possibly, hopefully, even love that's connected to it. If that's what you want your child's experience to be, you have to talk to them about sex and saying, if this is not what you're feeling for this person before you engage in these acts, this is not a person that you should be dealing with. And what does it look like if that person cares for you? What does it look like if that person loves you? What does it look like if that person is sexually responsible? What does it look like if that person wants to engage in sex with you and not just for the sake of being on the inside of your body or, or sliding down on your dome, but a person who actually wants to share their body with you? That is a conversation that should be, that should be had. That's not happening. So and honestly, that that's the thing that's supposed to be able to you you have time to invest in under the covenant of marriage. That's one yeah. of the reasons why they say you should be in a committed relationship, but yeah. because you're talking about putting in work. Come on. Doing sex well means putting in work. Girl. It isn't just magical, you know, the Disney stuff starts exploding behind the castle yeah. kind yeah. of yeah. nonsense. Yeah. And if you're going into that thinking that you're going to be disappointed when, when you, you do about, that situation. Yeah, here's did. another one. Here's, here's a myth. Let me dispel. Um, you don't necessarily break your hymen the first time you have sex. Um, you could break your hymen before you have sex. Or way past the fifth time you have sex. It's not always going to get broken. So if that's how you're measuring whether or not you've popped someone's cherry and all the other horrible food analogies we associate with our <laughs> sex <laughs> life. <laughs> Melons, you know, what What else do we do? Uh, lollipop. Like, yeah. I mean, all the words that we say rather than penis, vagina, <laughs> you know, all yeah. the other proper yeah. terms that you're supposed to use yeah, yeah, for this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, just well, cool. okay. I gotta back it up a little bit and <laughs> and 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 do this one too. So both of these for men and women are are still covered in shame a bit, but the women are much more shamed, in my opinion, than the men when it comes to self stimulation of your reproductive parts. Okay, growing up the hustlers and all the playboy stuff and everything like it's expected that once a young man is old enough that he starts realizing he's he's beginning his ability to be able to procreate okay mm -hmm. meaning he can ejaculate and he's got sperm that's ready to rock and roll and all that kind of stuff right um i'm sorry semen let me say semen and then the sperm and all mm -hmm. yeah so it's okay for the guys to figure out Okay, this works. This works. Oh, this is horrible. This doesn't work. Oh, I gotta feel these things too. Oh, I got two testicles. Oh, you know, all that stuff. They're expected to experiment on that. Now, we still sh have a shame culture because think the movie American Pie. 
when he was trying to figure out what was going on with him in our in our culture in our in our art mm -hmm. in movies we reinforce that negative stereotype where this young man is trying to figure out what's going on with his body his father walks in pillow that's the image the pillow goes over dad you're supposed yeah. to knock before you come in yeah. so they still have shame associated with it but it is more socially acceptable for a boy to jerk off yes. and figure out what then, then helps then him I, to get where he needs to go then it is for girls to touch on their vagina yeah. and their yeah. clitoris and all the other kind of stuff in there. Yeah. If you're caught doing that, you are vilified. You're fast. Yeah. You're 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 a, you're a woman of hard yeah, morals. You're therapy. all this stuff. Yeah, they're taking you to therapy because I and I think that's the thing is that I will say that it is normal to have sexual curiosity with yourself or like you say reproductive curiosity with yourself because it's your body part. You got ears. You got a nose. You got an eye. You, whatever you know you know what everything on your body feels like and what happens when you touch those things so it's only and you need to know what your body feels like mm -hmm. under normal mm -hmm. circumstances because just yeah. as we determine and I'm, I'm gonna let you go just mm -hmm. as we determine um uh when when you're doing a self and you should do a self breast exam at mm -hmm. least once a month because mm -hmm. if you don't know what your breasts feel like normally if you don't know what your breasts feel like when you're going through your menstrual cycle because those are changes too you mm -hmm. won't be able to figure out if there is a strange foreign bump that yeah. happens happens when mm -hmm. you're going through your menstrual cycle i'm just gonna say sometimes your breasts can get lumpy in different places mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that you have breast cancer it mm -hmm. means that you have these glands inside of these wonderful milk sacs which is yeah. essentially what they are uh yeah. when you need them to be uh mm -hmm. sometimes stuff gets gummed up and you need to you need to be comfortable knowing what normal feels like and what abnormal feels like so you can know to get your behind to the donation and i'm like i'm a case where it was like you there was no one worth me risking my wellness and 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 well being. There, there was I don't care how cute, how smooth someone talked, um, nothing. And what was actually maybe the blessing of my growing up was that no one even really considered, for the most part, bringing that to me. I guess it's the way I carried myself. Maybe they were terrified of my father too, um, but. I, I didn't have to bat away a whole lot. And in fact, at one point, I thought maybe something was wrong with me because I wasn't having guys approach me in that way. But remember, I said I had a lot of guy friends. One time I just asked them, I was like, dang, I mean, y'all go for this and that and that. And I'm like, and here I am. And I'm not saying I'm trying to get with you, but like, I don't get it. Like, I don't have, and people were like, Marta, no one's going to do that with you. Yeah. Because they know, <laughs> they know. They know, yeah. If they do that with you, then they're locked in, you know. Yeah. And well, a lot of people aren't ready. It. That goes. That goes back to what I'm saying with the the population that is unfortunately given given the moniker that it has is mm -hmm. that I'm not saying that all boys that were having sex in high school are boys that were going to try to hurt girls' feelings, but I think mm -hmm. that naturally, just the na the nature of the hunger of what testosterone can do to a body and to a mind. They're listening to what you're saying, but they're like, what do I have to do for her to feel comfortable enough for me to sleep with her? And so I can do this. So I can do this. And I'm not going to hurt her, but I really want to use her body to ejaculate. So what do I have to do? With that's this what thing? it is. And that's hard to hear that. I gulped when you said it a little bit, because it's like, that's not what you're talking. You're like, no, when he does that, it means he loves no, me and he wants no, to protect no. me and I keep me safe. And I say this often, and I say this to young ladies, and I say this to really young ladies. I say young boys, for the most part, usually have already uh, you know, masturbated and stuff like that by the time they're coming to present themselves to you. And they're literally looking at you saying, hey, my hand is awesome but I would love if you would allow me through conversation and maybe taking you out sometimes, if you could be my hand alternative, can I use your body to ejaculate into? You that said hand alternative, you. oh bless, bless. It's what it is. And if That's he's what a nice guy, sure, I might enjoy the process of using my body as a hand alternative. Cause here's it's the thing, really when, when we say young men, we we mean they can be, they can have that mentality up to 28, 32. <laughs> 35. <laughs> yeah, it's not deep. And so when you make when you when, so when you were saying, hey, I wasn't I wasn't that kind of guy that dudes was coming at because it was going to require more than just you being a hand alternative. You're like, you're gonna have to love me, you're gonna have to listen to me do this, you're gonna have to be a part of my life. And they were like, Mark, you are awesome. But I'm gonna need a low-hanging fruit that is going to be okay with a, a, a couple of pillow talks and a couple of compliments and a meal or two. For, for me, me to, to get my release. 
for me to get my release. I, that's what I'm looking for here. And I think that you're awesome. Your wife material. But I just need some jizz material right now. And that's what it is. They're not going to tell you that. But no. that's what it is. If it don't, Unless like, you have some of the guys. <laughs> <laughs> but, but here's the other thing, too. Think yeah. about the dynamic that creates for the women, too. Because, again, our society still considers those who... Make a choice because most most of the time it's a choice unless it's a, a situation of rape and that's horrific and a whole nother conversation. But if a woman chooses to um, to be sexually active and to uh, wait, if she chooses to be sexually active or she chooses to be sexually promiscuous, because sexual act, act, sexually active doesn't mean that you're promiscuous. And I want to be uh, specific in that. Um what does that do when you got a sexually promiscuous young woman and a woman who's not engaging in sex at all, and they're in the same community of young people? They're competing for academics. They're competing for attention. They're competing for all these things. Um, if society says that in some instances that sexually promiscuous young woman is more desirable because she has more knowledge and she knows what she's doing and she knows how to satisfy men. But on the other side, she's also a fallen woman because she's not married yet. You know, that's a head trip and a call for counseling. But then you've got the woman who's choosing not to have sex and she's over here wondering, Am I desirable? Will I be able to satisfy my eventual partner? I don't have information. I'm trying to do this the best way I can. Oh, by the way, what the hell is this feeling I'm having when I just, I'm like, oh, I'm hot and I can't breathe and I can't focus and I can't think and what do I do? And you slip up and be like, oh, well, that worked. <laughs> you know I, mean? Yeah, that exactly I mean, there's so much, like we need mandatory counseling, period, yeah. period. It should yeah. be it should be something you can get for free, like going to Planned Parenthood. By the way, I don't want to get off of this conversation without having a good little chance to talk about Planned Parenthood for a minute. Mm -hmm. But just a segue in there. But yeah. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Before you get even to that, to the segue of that, when it comes to the balance, you know, I think that it goes both. It, it, it's the same, but different for men. When you have guys, and I'm saying, you know, the popular guys, he's out there swinging and banging, and you got the guy who's a good guy, but he's not out there swinging and banging with anybody. Ironically, it's usually flipped. When the guy's out there swinging and banging, you feel like he has more to offer because, hey, if girls are liking him or, you know, he has more sexual experience, it means he can turn it out and he knows what he's doing. And then you got a guy who's a good guy, nice guy, smart guy, and he hasn't really gotten around to it yet or whatever the case, are people paying him any attention? And so... When you flip it for women, it's a woman can be out there and she's a fallen woman because she's out there. And you've got a woman who's not out there and you're looking at her like, oh, nobody wants her because nobody, nobody is approaching her in that way. I think all of it is a mind trip. And, and mm -hmm. I'm more focused on young ladies only because we're the ones that get the shorthand of the stick when it comes to social expectations. And oh, so yeah. the focus in the conversation that I have is usually from that perspective. And so for myself, I, you know, I, I, I wasn't the chick that guys were running after, not for real, for real. But I too was the same way to say people knew that you're going to have to make a level of effort that is beyond what you feel like dealing with. And not mm -hmm. saying that it's negative or that it's bad or that they're being selfish or whatever the case. No, they're looking for something that takes less effort. I mean, and, and I hate that. I hate the term of low hanging fruit as if to say that the women who don't require as much as other women uh, are, are rotten or they're no good. I'm not saying that, but mm -hmm. it is easier to get if, if you have a list of expectations before you engage in sex with a guy, a woman might say he's good looking, He's a nice guy. He makes a decent amount of money. Um, he's, you know, he holds a good conversation. He's intelligent. That's a dude that I, I would, I would definitely consider sleeping with. He has a nice body. Okay, yeah, I would. If I got to, got along with him, yeah, I would do that. That's mm -hmm. not your list. That's not my list. And so a guy who's like, man, I'm smart. I'm good looking. You know, I'm nice to people. You telling me I can't get it? Not me. But I'm not saying that she is is worse than me. It's just that we have different expectations for a person who wants to access our bodies. So I, I, I require something totally different or add it onto that than she does. So by all means, please seek so you can find what it is that you want. And there's nothing wrong with her. That's the kind of what you want can change. And to bring it all the way back to our initial thing is the decisions and the power you have to make the best decisions for yourself earlier in life, the yeah. better likelihood you're going to be prepared to go ahead and meet 
those eventual um, commitments and obligations that you do when you talk about bringing in a life into the world. Mm -hmm. How many young men could have potentially benefited from having had the choice? Because I do I do kind of agree um, with my mama that they need to have some part of the choice in it because they, they need to take some ownership in it. It shouldn't be something done to them if it if at all possible. Let me say it that way, um, because you can get in a lot of legal stuff with that down the line. But if a young man could, with mm -hmm. less anxiety, know that if I find someone who is willing to be my hand substitute, <laughs> I love that. I'm going to use that. I want a shirt. I want a shirt. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, if I can lessen the likelihood that I'm going to obligate her to make a decision as to whether or not to terminate a life or to bring a life into the world by doing this thing, because I know I'm not ready to go ahead and have a baby that I'm responsible for. I mean, why? how, how many more men could have gone on and done things to be productive? How many young women could have gone on the things to do stuff more productive um, if they did not have that additional responsibility, which resulted from usually poor information? That's mm -hmm. what, if you have full information, if you're a woman who fully understands your ovulation cycle and you're hooking up with a dude who fully understands your ovulation cycle and, and his, his male fertility and whatnot, and y'all say, let's do it anyway, it's going to be fun. That's different. But that's not usually the case scenario. Mm -hmm. The case scenario is usually you're going off of assumptions about certain things. Like she's she says, oh yeah, no, I'm I'm it's not I'm not on cycle right now. Or you know, or he's saying because you, you're there. I personally have difficulty understanding being out of your mind, so horny that like you can't think rationally. But that's me. OK, I'm not one to get carried away with passion when it comes to sexual reproduction. I'm just not. Um, and I'm, I'm comfortable saying that. I'm just no. <laughs> but I, I acknowledge that there are some people who they can get caught up in that. And so, like you were saying um, at one point, making sure that you have some muscle memory so that you can do the things, the preventative things to lessen the likelihood that in a moment of passion, you go and do something and then you have regrets later. Cause, oh my God, how awful is it to have had a beautiful moment? And then after that, feel regret but see, that's the thing. fear. I, I can give you an example. Um, I, I worked with a young lady who was HIV positive and she, when I was doing my HIV uh, testing and, and education and things like that, I was doing before. And she would speak about her experience and everything like that. And I told her, oh, we were talking one time, wonderful woman. And I was sitting with her one time and she told me, she's like, uh, I was like, I asked her, I said, do you know who gave you uh, HIV? Do you know who it was? She's like, hell no. <laughs> I'm saying that she said, she's like, hell no, but I can tell you it wasn't worth it. <laughs> and that stuck with me because I have experienced, I guarantee you have, and I have too, experienced absolutely wonderful sexual experiences. Wonderful. Right? I'm talking about wonderful. <laughs> Hands down, that was something that I could write a poem about. But even that is <laughs> yeah. not worth a child that I'm not ready for. It's no. not worth my health. It's not worth my sanity or my happiness. And so and, and the highest level of orgasmic insanity where they might have to reshock my heart I'm talking about, I don't care how astronomically glorious that experience is. It's not worth it if it goes left after the fact. I don't, I oh, don't. Yeah. So this woman is telling us, she's like, I, she said this. She's like, I don't know what it was, but I can tell you it wasn't worth it. Because it, it wasn't worth it. And completely it completely transformed her life. Completely. It transformed her life forever. <laughs> and she's living mm -hmm. a happy, glorious life, but she's like, it ain't worth it. I don't know the person, the people that I've spoken to. We worked with a lot of them. We, we worked with hundreds of people who were HIV positive, probably hundreds, at least dozens of people who were HIV positive. And none of them were like, man, I know I got to deal with this for the rest of my life. But man, that nut though, nobody is saying that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No. Nobody is saying that. And for me, I look at the responsibility of continued health issues that HIV can present as the equivalent of the responsibility of a child. And I'm not trying to compare children to diseases. I'm only saying the responsibility that you have to wake up and create a day that maintains your safety because you're yeah. now dealing with this disease. 
is the same way you have to wake up and maintain a safe environment for the child that you created that you weren't ready for. And so it's like, that's, that's, so you, so even you saying, Hey, I'm never that hungry that I think it's a healthy mindset that sex is great. You enjoy it. You want it, but it's never worth your life's risk. And your life is at risk. If you're exposing yourself to things that you're not ready for that, the, the happiness of life or the fullness of life, if you don't want that child, whether or not you have to terminate or you keep it or whatever the case may, have, may be, your life is changed in that moment. And so I'm thinking, how can we prevent that change from happening? You know what I'm saying? Like, how, what do we do? How do we do it? So that's why I keep saying, I'm, if, if we're going to go down this road of, of birth control for boys, I'm sticking to baby. <laughs> <laughs> and I can respect your position on that. I can respect your position on that. But I, I can also tell you, I know, I know people, particularly dudes, who will have boy children and just the thought. Yeah, I know. I know. Of clipping something off of their baby, their their baby boy's penis mm-hmm. makes gives them the heebie jeebies. Yeah. I ain't gonna call no names, but I know several, several. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Showing Our Sass, the podcast. We hope you enjoyed the conversation, and in fact, we'd love for you to jump in and tell us what you think. Remember to share, like, subscribe, comment, all those good things, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you.